let us go ahead. Come on, get up. Prayer. Almighty God, you are our sustainer, provider, Lord, and Savior. Open our eyes now, we pray, O oh God, that we receive your word. Open your words to our hearts, that we will hear what you have to say, us, to say to us, and be courageous enough to respond obediently to that word. Hear us as we pray together in your name. Amen. Certainly we continue our reflections during the season of Advent, the third Sunday in Advent. And we want to share a little more on the theme of watchfulness, but noting that watchfulness is being responsible as we pick up this theme, drawing on the passages which we have read so far, the responsive reading from Isaiah, the passage from the, from the prophet Ezekiel, and also from John's Gospel. Watchfulness is a way of showing care for our neighbors. And when we talk about care, we are talking about a concern for the overall welfare and well-being of a person. We are talking about the concern for the person's spiritual, physical, and mental well-being. So it is not only their material care or concern, it is concern for the overall needs of the person. And one way of showing this here is to warn our neighbors of impending danger, of obstacles that may be in the way of anything or anyone that may threaten their existence or security. It is because we care why we would warn such persons. You warn persons only if they are important to you. If you are in the same community, if you share a common bond and a common destiny or goal, you warn people if you love them, if you are concerned about their welfare, their survival, and their general safety. Those are the reasons why you warn someone. A warning must be about a real danger, a real and present danger. The person who sounds the warning must ensure that there is adequate assessment of the danger. You can't warn someone of danger and you haven't adequately assessed if this is real danger. If a false alarm is given, it could discredit the sentinel or watchman or caller and could put the community in danger when there is real danger. You're all familiar with the story of the little boy who cried, Wolf, Wolf, when the town people went to his assistance. He laughed at them. One day the wolves actually attacked. But when he sounded the alarm, no one responded. And the sheep were attacked and eaten by wolves. The attitude we make in terms of preparation for danger is sometimes reflection of how we understand the message communicated to us. I remember when we, it was announced that we are going to re, uh, we are going to be receiving, or we are going to the hurricane mat was going to descend upon us. There are some persons who made frantic preparations. There are some who said. We don't think Matthew is coming. And so eventually, when Matthew just spurted us, said, see then, we told you that Matthew wasn't coming. And some people even complained to the meteorologist, saying that they overcalled. I wonder if some people take the position that next time we hear a call, we won't pay them by. The critical point to note is that 
the watchman or sentinel, according to Ezekiel, is strategically placed to warn the city. The whole city's welfare depends on his judgment. That's very important. His powers of discernment, his clarity of vision, and his acuity in hearing. What is the watchman hearing? What is the watchman seeing? What is the watchman's understanding and interpretation of the message? That is very important because you could send a wrong signal. You could not hear clearly and you send part of what you hear, like the story of the little boy who said that Moses said, Take, Moses said, Take off your shoes and eat goat meat. You ever heard that one? Take off your shoes and eat goat meat. He said, Then his mother asked, What did your Sunday school teacher say to you today? Moses was talking about take off your shoes. God said to Moses, take off your shoes from off your feet. The little boy heard, take off your shoes and he told me. We have to be absolutely clear that we get the message. Because if you get the wrong message, what you convey is what people are going to respond to. He or she has to display the powers of assessment as to the nature of the danger and when it could affect the city. In a word, the watchman offers light. The watchman offers hope. The watchman offers truth. In the case of Ezekiel, the prophet outlined some characteristics of the temporal watchman. And then these principles are applied to the prophet as a spiritual watchman in the community of Israel. There are so many similarities for which we need to take careful note. There are spiritual leaders who we call pastors and priests, bishops and evangelists and apostles and so on. And these persons are responsible to watch over our souls. There are also pilgrims or children of God. We are passing through this land. The world is not our home. The words of Jim Reed, the world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. We are passing through. We are pilgrims. This is not our home to stay. So we need to be reminded that we are passing through. It is in this sense that this is not our home that we live as citizens of the kingdom. And we demonstrate kingdom values. These include love, holiness, and justice, forgiveness, turning away from evil, and turning towards righteousness. Turning away from darkness, and turning towards light. This is the message of the sentinel or the watchman. And so I want to suggest, I want to highlight three of the principles from this passage. You know that warning and watchfulness go together and warning of danger is an indication of care. Warning and watchfulness go together and warning is an indication of care. If God did not love us and desire the best for us, he would not warn us of danger to come. God would not be concerned about what happens to our lives in this world. But God cares. God is concerned that we may be locked in darkness. And God wants to take us out of darkness into light. In stating the functions of the watchman, the prophet noted that he selected from among the people to watch for their interests. In the case of the prophet, Ezekiel, it is God who appoints the watchman. It is God who is watching over the souls of his saints. So, not like the Greeks understand soon, which is different from the spirit and the body, but from the Hebraic understanding, where the soul is a total person. Man became a living soul. So, the soul is a total person. Sometimes we focus on the warning so much that it comes across as a bother, as an interruption of our lives, as an interference of our business, or an interruption or interference 
of our private lives. What is that to you sometimes when one may ask? Why should you care if I come to church or not? Why should you care if I read my Bible or not? That is between me and God. Why should it concern you what I do with my smartphone or my communication devices? In my spare time, with my body, while I'm on the job. Why should it concern you what I do with my life? Go and preach and leave me to live my private life alone. Some are a little more sophisticated. They come to church because it is socially acceptable. And it is the decent thing to do, as that is how I was brought up. But, I, but don't bother me with any additional church responsibilities. That's for those who are not as busy as I am. Can we identify with any of those expressions? <coughs> with any of those sentiments? There are those who may claim, leave my life alone. Leave me alone. So if the watchman, if the sentinel, if the person appointed by God to make clear what is darkness and to say to person, leave darkness and get into light. The way of interpreting for others that if you are living a life that is unacceptable to God, then you need to change. You need to make a shift in that approach and embrace the light that God offers. Some persons who may say, leave me. What is it that Ezekiel says in verse 15? Ezekiel says, as he explains what it is that persons are to do to reflect that there is a change. Before we note what Ezekiel says, I want you to note what John says. John preached to the people in the wilderness. He said, the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Who warned you of the wrath to come? Here we have the prophet John. Preaching as a watchman, preaching as a sentinel, preaching as a warner, declaring God's word, saying, this is light. You are in darkness. Escape from darkness into this light. And he offers them, he says, repent. Turn from your evil ways. Turn from your sin. The sin of which you are guilty. Not your neighbor's sin, but your sin. It's very often persons in this society are well conversant with their neighbor's sin but conveniently not clear about their own sin. Run away from the cancerous evil that is consuming your life minute by minute, day by day. They asked John what they were to do and in Luke's account of John's response we see or we hear John saying this. The crowds asked, What then shall we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Whoever has food must likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized and they asked him, Teacher, what shall we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. When you look at Ezekiel 33 and verse 15, listen to what the prophet says. If they give back what they took in pledge for a loan, that is a deposit, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do not know evil, that person, that person will surely live. They will not die. In other words, this is the warning. This is the message from the prophet. This is the message from the watchman. This is the message from the sentinel. He, he is presenting a challenge to those who live in darkness and he gives specific ways in which wrongs can be right. Specific ways in which behavior can be corrected. Specific ways in which there can be a change. So if persons are ignorant of what needs to be done, here the sentinel explains what can be done. 
No era of society is omitted. No individual, no group, no person is excluded. But every single person is challenged. You are living in darkness if these behaviors are part of your life. And the word from the sentinel, the word from the prophet, the word of life, the word of truth, the, the word of hope is that you are to desist from this behavior. As I said, many persons would say, thank God, Parson, none of those apply to me. And we are all very careful and conscious about those to whom it applies to. But I want you to know the word from the sentinel, the word from the warner or from the prophet is a word directed to all of us. And the word comes as a manifestation, as a demonstration of God's care and concern to warn us of danger. The prophet's job is to warn you of the evil, the darkness that you dwell in, and to guide you towards the light. Remember, whenever state or civil society appoints an earthly watchman, or today we may refer to such persons as whistleblowers, a sentinel, such a person may be, to watch for and warn if danger were to come. Sometimes there are symbols within our society that warn us of danger. You go into some places and you see a sign, no smoking. Why? Because there is material present that is flammable. Stop. But we all know that sign. Observe the speed limit, speed limit. And we know that one. And there will be persons who will enforce these or there are persons who comply, but there are persons who may not comply because they assume that there is nobody to enforce these. In Jamaica, the question may be asked if the government is more concerned about raising money or maintaining discipline on the roads. What is the question? The government has extended or had a period of amnesty for those who were charged or giving tickets for violating traffic um, rules and then extending that amnesty, one may ask, what is the concern? Is it about raising money or is it about maintaining discipline? You make your decision on that. But penalty should not just be fines or we, we may need to consider whether license should be suspended because we talk about the carnage on the road. We talk about lives which have been, which have been lost because of persons operating on the road, violating the rules of the road. And so the warning signs and the warning songs are to alert us to danger and to assist us in taking preventive action. It comes from a position of care. The society wants to ensure that there is order within the society. And that is why rules exist. You pick this up also in uh, Romans 30. We talk about laws and the functions of laws. Some people despise them, but they exist for a purpose. They exist to create order and harmony within the society. But you know, there are two times in the New Testament where it is recorded that Jesus wept. When Lazarus died in, in John 11, 35, and when he wept over Jerusalem, when they did not heed the warning from the prophets. What this is saying is that when a warning is given, it is given out of a heart of concern. It is given out of a heart of compassion. So much so that when Jesus looked at Jerusalem, he wept over Jerusalem because the warning was given by the prophet warning about their darkness, warning about the light that they were living, which was inconsistent with their relationship with God. And they are called as God's people. And they did not heed the warning. It bled the heart of Jesus. You want to tell me that there is anything, anything else that you can talk about that demonstrates here more than that? Jesus' heart bled. 
One whose songs come to us, as I say, from a position of care. So it is. It is God who appoints the spiritual leader. As the prophet states in the responsive reading that we read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news, good tidings, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It is God who calls me. It is God who anoints me. So whereas in a secular society, the state establishes laws to warn persons of danger and to warn persons of their lifestyle, in the church, the Lord appoints prophets whom he anoints and inspires to warn people of their lives so that they may move from darkness into light. You get the message? It is the Lord who appoints those persons. The Lord appoints them out of care. The element of care and compassion for the soul is evident. That is why this service is needed. So my brothers and sisters, when deacons, class leaders, or other auxiliary leaders, or concerned members, or even your pastor may point out to you that your life is in danger if you continue on the path being pursued. Don't think that somebody is being a busybody. Are you hearing me? Don't think that somebody is being a busybody. There's a genuine concern about your welfare. A concern that brings tears sometimes. Another time sleepless nights and long hours in prayer. This is genuine love for your souls. But warning or whistleblowing is not only a demonstration of care. Secondly, receiving or rejecting the warning is the hearer's responsibility. Receiving or rejecting the warning is the hearer's responsibility. If you hear and heed, thank God, you would have saved yourself. If the, hearer, if the hearer hears and ignores or is indifferent and is overtaken by the sword or danger according to the prophet, then that person is responsible for himself or herself. The issue of personal responsibility rather than community responsibility stands out here. The person who warns is showing his or her responsibility as has made a clear assessment of the threat and has warned of impending danger because the message is clearly understood and so the person conveys the message. However, the responders made it clear that that is nonsense. It is foolishness. It is political propaganda. It is hogwash, you name it. And we may find all kinds of words to describe the warning we receive. We may find all kinds of words to describe it because by doing so, by rejecting or when we reject, we have to show that what we are rejecting is not good enough for us. You know the story of sour grapes? Because you can't get them, they are sour. And so when the word comes, when the warning comes, and when you do not like the warning, you find a way to either criticize the preacher or criticize the interpretation or criticize some the, the person who is the bearer of the message. In Jesus' days, what did they do? They crucified the prophets and then they crucified Jesus. They say we reject this message that he bring. Let me share a story with you. Some statistics uh, were done on um, persons, or a survey was done to investigate persons in Florida as to why they did not respond to warnings about Hurricane Irma. They gave some reasons why people did not respond to the warning. Some say it was disability. There are persons who are disabled. 
They cannot move and they have no one to help them. Some said that they did not hear the warning despite the media opportunities that they had, they did not hear the warning. Some persons responded by saying that they did not want to leave their pets. Despite the hurricane warning and the, and the threat, they did not want to leave their pets. There are others who claim that those who refused to leave, they did not want to leave their property because if they left their property, persons would come and loot it while they were away. There are those who said they are not believing, they don't believe that any hurricane is coming. This is a wolf cry. They have heard the cry before and no hurricane came, so they don't believe it at all at this time. I want to suggest that when you think about these responses, they're not different from responses that people in Jamaica would make. But each of them is important. They are persons with disability. If we were to interpret this in terms of why is it that when you proclaim the gospel that some people do not respond? Think of people in our society with disability. They cannot hear. How do we communicate with the hearing impaired? What strategies do we have as church to communicate with those persons who can't hear? How will they know the gospel unless somebody decides that they're going to learn sign language so they can communicate with them? What about those who cannot see? How do we help them? There are persons that I remember years ago, that an office at the camp on the university campus, we had a chat with um, work. And I used to see these students coming over. And there were a number of persons in the adjoining office that were visually impaired. And there were a number of students who came over and as part of their assignment to read for these persons. They would read their assignments, they would read questions for them, they would read pages and pages of books for them so that they would be able to respond. Are there persons who are willing to position themselves to help persons to make sure that the word is heard? What about those persons who are mentally challenged? What about those persons who are old men and old women? but they have the mental age of a three-year-old or a four-year-old. How do we communicate with them the gospel? How do we make the word known to them? Remember, if it is their responsibility when they hear about danger, how are they going to respond if there isn't someone to interpret for them? Then there are some people who say they didn't hear the warning. I don't think we should take this for granted. As much as persons have more access to communication technology. There are some persons who are tuned only to one thing and they never listen to anything else. So a hurricane could be around them. The place could be burning down around them. But they are tuned in only to something else. Probably they are responding to what has not hit the particular program they are listening to. Those who refuse to leave their pets. This is a serious thing. Does God call us? And when God calls us? And when God challenges us about our lifestyle? He said, boy, we can't give our life to Jesus right now. It may not be physical pets that you have, but it may be some things in your life which you have made your pets. You have made those objects or those behaviors your pets. And you are causing those pets to keep you where you are rather than releasing yourself and move out of darkness into light. Sometimes it may be friends, Lord, I cannot give you my life now because I will not be able to lie with my friends. Those who refuse to leave because their property might be plundered. What is it that Jesus says that if you give up in this life, you will not receive a hundredfold in the life to come? And what it is that you can take with you. And so we hold on to these things and we allow our material things to come between us and God. What matters in the long run when God is calling us out of darkness into life. When God is saying that there is death around you, you are being swallowed by a cancer of evil. We hear only, no oh Lord, we're not ready. We can't leave what we have. 
Or maybe there are some people who may cry wolf. Look how long we hear that Jesus has come. And it takes so long. We have to continue to live my life a little longer. Because I can't bother with this Jesus business or this Christianity business. It is going to slow down my life. We hear the word. But the response is different. There are two characteristic behavior on the line those actions. The thought of foolishness. What we hear is foolishness. Wolf cry. Not because it never came as some people said. It did not do the damage. I anticipated. It will not come. The fool says in his heart. There is no God. God would never do this to us. Some people argue. God will not destroy us. And so when we pray. And the hurricane is averted and it goes to Haiti or it goes to Dominican Republic. We say, thank you Lord for saving us. And we forget and we wonder, did the Lord, was the Lord merciful and our neighbors? Or is it that Jesus is saying that men prefer darkness rather than light? John picks up that God. Men prefer darkness rather than light because they are deep. Part of the theme, the mental theme or idea, idea is foolishness. Or on the line, the action is also fear. Fear of losing out, of leaving loved ones. Jesus called a man and he said he has to go and bury his father. What did Jesus say? Let the dead bury their dead. Leave, come to me now. What happened to Lot's wife? She was looking back at Sodom and she was lamenting the fact that she had to leave all she had in Sodom. And what happened to Lot's wife? She became a pillar. Sometimes it is fear of losing out and fear of making a commitment. Jesus says, whoever will follow me, let him take up his cross. Whoever will come after me, take up his cross and follow me. Sometimes we are not prepared to make that commitment of our life. It is fear of giving all to Jesus. And sometimes we do not leave the darkness. We do not respond to the warning. We do not respond to the danger that is communicated to us, that is going to envelop us. Because of fear, fear of making a commitment to the one who is concerned about us. Jesus tells his disciples in Luke 9 verse 5 that when you proclaim the word and they don't hear, people do not welcome you. Leave their town and shake the dust from off your feet as a testimony against it. That's so hard enough. It's a hard word of Jesus. But when there is no response or when the response is inappropriate, I want you to understand that what we are picking up in this passage in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is saying that each person is responsible. Whether you receive or you reject, you are responsible for what you hear. So you need to take the responsibility of finding out what is the word, finding out what was said, finding out what is the truth that is proclaimed, finding out what it is that God cares about, what it is that God wants you to do. How often people find themselves in situations where they are overcome by danger and they begin to blame God. God, imagine you saw me living like this and you didn't warn me, Lord. Imagine you know I was in danger, Lord, and you didn't say anything. You didn't stop me, Lord. Couldn't you send somebody to stop me, Lord? Sometimes we blame God when the Lord has been sending different messengers to us, but we are not listening to the message. We are not responding to the message. We criticize the messenger and we kill the messenger. But the message still stands. May God help us to understand we are responsible. We are responsible for our lives. If the sentinel blows the trumpet and says danger is coming, it is our responsibility to heed that warning. When God is warning us, many times we are preoccupied in doing what we want so we can't hear from God. It's not for the preacher. We sometimes blame our parents for not teaching 
teaching us enough. We blame the pastors for not preaching that subject. We often find others to blame rather than taking responsibility. So whether, as I said, we accept or reject or refuse or respond, each of us will be held responsible for our actions. Others can be caring and patient. That is why we are to do all we can to persuade and encourage as some people need more persuasion than others. But that is our job. The prophets pleaded. Jesus wept. Parents agonized. But the final decision is yours. The third and final observation I want to make is that the sentinel who sees and remains silent will be held accountable. The sentinel who sees, remember you know, the sentinel is positioned at a place over the land where the sentinel can see what is happening. When the sentinel sees, the sentinel has to make sure that what he sees is interpreted carefully. What he hears is understood clearly. And then the sentinel must send out the warning. And when the sentinel does that, seeing, evaluating, and assessing, the sentinel pulls all together. The sentinel makes a judgment call. The sentinel also refused to do so out of fear of ignorance of the times because sometimes the sentinel may not be able to interpret because the sentinel is not okay in the times. The sentinel reads the word, but the sentinel not listening to the world. The sentinel reads the Bible, but the sentinel not listening to what people are saying. And so the sentinel is not aware of what is happening and therefore cannot communicate appropriately to the people. The sentinel may be unaware. The prophet may be misguided. The prophet may lack seriousness. The prophet may fail to warn. And danger hits the people and they are destroyed. The prophet, the teacher, the preacher, the leader, will be held accountable. We'll be judged and punished by God for failing to warn the people. Why would a leader know his or her responsibility and impact on his people and fail to blow the trumpet in a case of crisis? Why would a leader do that? I want to suggest some reasons quickly. You know, maybe the bugle is not working so right. You know? The leader goes up, the sentinel goes up and he's going to blow the bugle. And it doesn't have any sound in it. You know what that means? He never spent some time to check to make sure that the bugle was working properly. We all need to pause in our lives from time to time and check to make sure that the message that we are presenting is the right message. We need a tuning up from time to time. Amen? All of us need that tuning up from time to time. Remember the five foolish virgins? They were quite contented, but they didn't stop to trim their lamps. And then they started begging from those who had done so. They had done their homework. They were ready. Be careful that you also do not fall asleep. Be careful of burnout. Be careful of overeating. Be careful of not taking care of your body. Be careful of not taking care of your spirit. See that he or she did not alert the people because he did not care like Jonah. You know that there are sometimes some sentinels say, me not tell them nothing, me not want them change. That was Jonah's problem. And there are some people who say they're not telling anybody anything to warn them about their life so that they will change because it is not their responsibility. Some people see their neighbor in danger and rather than call out to them, they say, hello, danger is coming. They whisper to them. Who can you hear a whisper when you need to hear a shout? Who can you respond to a whisper? So you can't say they didn't say anything. They said something. But what was said could not be heard. My brothers and sisters, are you with me? Are you getting the message? Are you getting the point? All of us are sentinels. All of us are responsible. All of us 
have the responsibility to share with our neighbor, to let our neighbor know if there is evil, what that evil is that they may be engaged in and warn them. To identify the darkness that they are living in and point them to the light. Whatever the reason, the Lord is saying to Ezekiel as a prophet of the Lord that the watchman will be held responsible if he fails to warn of danger. Is that what Paul is talking about when he says, But I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not become disqualified. In other words, I make sure that I discipline myself. I make sure that I'm walking with God. I make sure that I'm in the Word. I make sure that I'm communing constantly with God so that when the judgment call is made, I am not disqualified. Are you like all preparing yourself, checking your trumpet, making sure that you're walking with the Lord? So when the preacher challenges the people to turn from evil, to turn from their wicked ways, the motivation is love of neighbor and obedience to God. This is the verdict. The light has come into the world, but men love darkness more than light. Because their deeds are evil. What is the message to us today? God wants us to remain watchful and it is being responsible to do so. As disciples, we are called to be responsible. Watchfulness and warnings go together as warning is an indication of divine care, divine grace, divine mercy, divine compassion. Receiving or rejecting the warning is the hearer's responsibility. We hear, we need to take heed, we need to find out what is being said, even if it comes across as a whisper, it is our responsibility. Sentinel who sees and remains silent will be held accountable. May God help us to recognize that he sent his son at this time. And we are to be reminded as we celebrate in the Advent season the coming of our Lord, the celebration of the coming of our Lord, what it is that God wants for us. Watchfulness is being responsible. And God wants us to be responsible disciples. Let us bow our heads. Moment of prayerful reflection of the world. Lord, you continue to call us. You continue to warn us of the ways in which we live that you are walking on the right side, but we are way over on the left. You continue to warn us of the dangers on that side, because we are not even in arm's reach for you to pull us over if something goes wrong. Lord, teach us. Help us, O oh God, to recognize that we are in darkness, to have the courage, the honesty, and the humility to see the light. Almighty God, we pray that as a God who is concerned, as a God who cares, as a God who is mindful of all of our lives and wants to see us flourish in every area of our lives. And this is your will because you created us according to your purpose. You know us, O oh God, and you desire the best for us. We are not just political objects. We are not just statistics. We are not just out there 
We are persons bought with a price. We are persons who you love and you wept for us when you realized we were not heeding your warning. Help us then, O God, in the name of Jesus, to respond to your call in our lives, to begin to see the light that you brought 